welcome to the new series. In this episode, I look at something a bit different. I play some games, and I chat to Alan Turvey about his new game, I have a chat to Jeff, and I have a new feature. Let's get on then. There are many SD or compact flash card adapters for the Spectrum, and they do pretty much the same thing. You add as many games as you like to the storage card, slot it into the interface, plug everything in, and away you go. You can browse the card, locate a game, and load it pretty much instantly. All great. Recently though, I discovered another such card that I'd not heard of before, and this one has a neat little trick up its sleeve. Meet the Backbit Pro cartridge. At first when I saw this I thought it was quite expensive, but then I started to dig a little deeper. The cartridge itself is housed in a 3D printed case, and has a micro SD card slot and a button on top. There's also an LED light on the front. Now eagle-eyed viewers will have noticed something. The connector will not plug into a spectrum. Ah, and here's the neat trick. The interface will work with over 30 retro systems, including the Atari 2600, 5200, the Commodore 64 and variants, VIC-20, ColecoVision, Sega Master System, Amstrad CPC and various models of Apple, and a whole lot more, obviously including the Spectrum. But how does it manage this? Well, the cartridge uses mini adapters for each system it connects with, and comes supplied with one of your choice. You can purchase as many additional adapters as you need for a price between £8 and £30, depending on the system. This means, for example, I can buy the cartridge with a Spectrum adapter for about £100, and also get a ZX81 adapter for £18. Considering the ZX Span for the ZX81, if you can actually find one of these SD interfaces, it would cost anywhere between £60 and £150, which makes the Backbit Pro cartridge not a bad deal. It becomes better the more systems you have and the more adapters you buy. The ZX81 adapter also includes a 16K RAM expansion, but onto the Spectrum version first. The adapter includes a joystick port as well, useful if you prefer that control method. You plug the adapter into the Spectrum, and then the cartridge into the adapter. Assuming you have previously copied some game files onto the micro SD card, you are ready to go. Turning it on, you get a red screen, and you can see the root of the SD card. There's also a real-time clock built in, if that's something you need. You can move up and down, select a game from the root or subfolders, Press enter and off you go. You can also type the name of a game in to do a search, and the cartridge accepts TAP or Z80 files. To get back to the menu, you just press the red button again. Yes, it's a simple interface, and I've seen much nicer ones. But remember, this has to function on over 30 different systems. Let's do a search for Jetpack. As soon as you enter the first few characters, the game is highlighted. Depending on the number of games you have on the micro SD card, the search will find games much faster than scrolling down a long list. There's also built-in mini menus that give you options to change the colour scheme, change the date and time, create folders, and even save the current game. To access these, you hold down the shift and press 1, 2, 3 or 4. I found these very tricky to control, as they were designed really for other computers with different key layouts. For example, if I wanted to change the time, I highlighted that and pressed enter, but pressing shift and zero, the spectrum delete command, did nothing. After what seemed like about 20 minutes, I discovered that you can delete it by pressing shift and then space. But then I couldn't type in numbers, so I had no way to set the time. Again, after a few long minutes of randomly stabbing at keys, I discovered that if you use the top row of keys, Q, W, E, R, T, etc, they represent the number keys. How odd. But at least I can set the time. It's not really important to me, but I was just testing it out. There are other tools as well that gives you details on the file you've loaded, and then shows you any saved versions of that. However, I couldn't work out how to save a version. I could make a duplicate of it, but I couldn't save out a game in progress, which is what it was designed for. I looked in the support forums, it seems that the save function is only really for Commodore machines. The adapter does not have a pass-through port, so to test the compatibility I plugged in the ZX HD first, which does, and then plugged the back bit into that, and it all worked fine. 
Whilst browsing the forums, I did pick up one reply that stated the back bit uses the system load and save routines, and some games that use custom fast loaders, for example Castlevania Spectral Interlude, don't work. There may be firmware updates in the future, as they seem to be pretty frequent, but it's something to keep in mind. Some games, depending how and when they were saved in tap format, also have issues, like my version of Pogo. No problem though, I just loaded it into an emulator, saved it out as a Z80, put that on the card, and it worked fine. This cartridge also has a built-in diagnostic function, accessed by holding down the red button while powering on the Spectrum, and here you can test various things. All in all, the base interface is a little expensive, yes, but if you have multiple retro systems, then this will soon pay for itself because you don't need to buy other interfaces, just adapters that are far cheaper. A great idea, and one that delivers, but it does need to be better documented, for all the systems it could be used on. I will probably be using this mostly on the ZX81, as I've got many such interfaces for the Spectrum, but it's still a great piece of kit. Talking of the ZX81, removing the cartridge from the Spectrum's adapter, plugging it into the ZX81 adapter, turning it on, and here we go, we get the same menu, albeit in black and white. Navigate the folders, find a game, pick one and it loads fine. Because it's got a built-in RAM expansion, you can also load 16K games. Here's 3D Monster Maze. And that works brilliantly. Having it work on both machines is brilliant, and something to consider if you have many systems requiring fast storage. Sevius was a 1982 vertical scrolling shoot -em -up released into the arcades by Namco. Unlike most games around at the same time, this gave you two weapons from the start, a normal laser and bombs. It was created to rival the classic scramble. The laser was used for enemy craft and the bombs, well, to bomb things really. To use the bomb accurately, there was a crosshair in front of the player's ship, and when this was over an enemy building or ground-based craft, you could drop a bomb. The landscape, consisting of green fields and rivers, scrolls smoothly and the simple looking graphics portray the action alongside basic sounds. Reviewing this gave me the opportunity to get out my mini arcade cab for a quick game as well. Not a bad arcade game, and it can be tricky at times, especially the later levels. The Spectrum version was released in 1986 by US Gold, and the inlay appears to have a Commodore 64 on it. There is a story about retaking the Earth from alien forces, but this is a shooter. No need for that nonsense. After a rather nice loading screen, the game follows the arcade counterpart quite well. The first thing to notice is the lack of the little tune playing, but this is a 48k game and not a 1 to 8k. The graphics are monochrome, which is often problematic, as with all monochrome shooters, it can be difficult to see enemy missiles because they get lost in the background. In this game though it's limited, due to the textures being mainly used, on the edge of the screen. We do get pixel scrolling though, but the sound consists of just simple blips and beeps, and it's the same sound for firing and bombing. The game appears shorter than the arcade version, even though the scrolling is near enough the same speed. Looking at the playthroughs, the arcade takes about 20 minutes to complete, and remember, this is constant scrolling, so the timing should be pretty similar. However, the Spectrum version can be completed in about 11 minutes. Despite this, the enemy sprites and motherships, along with ground-based targets, all look familiar. Just don't expect to find things in the same place as the arcade machine though. The spectrum screen has been cut down, both in height and width, and the rivers and seas at the left and right hand side of the screen are missing, so you lose the island and coastline effect early on. The roads are drawn with simple lines and have no colour.
Later, there does appear to be something that could be sea, but it's hard to tell. And with the textures that's used, it makes it difficult to see enemy fire. The game is fairly easy to play early on, with the fire button also dropping bombs, unlike the arcade, which has a separate button. It starts off giving you a feeling that you can get quite far, and then slowly builds up in difficulty. Later on you come across rotating barriers that can't be shot, homing missiles and fast-moving alien ships. After playing for about 20 minutes, having many, many games, I felt there was something missing. Yes, it does not have the colour or sound of the arcade, but something else was not there, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. The arcade game itself I can take or leave, to be honest, and would give it a go if other machines like Tempest, Galaxians, Missile Command, Phoenix, etc. were not free, but I wouldn't actively seek it out. A decent conversion then, considering the Spectrum's hardware, but so much more could have been done to give the player a better experience. Elbon House have made some outstanding games. The Hobbit, the adventure game that redefined arcade games, Penetrator, the excellent Scramble clone, We Have the Exploding Fist, and many, many more. But this one, well, let's see. Here is Hellfire, released in 1985. According to the inlay, you will reenact the trials of Ulysses in this fast moving arcade game. Onto the game, and well, it doesn't actually look exciting. In fact, it looks very bland. The first level, you have to get to the top of Mount Olympus while avoiding the falling boulders. Those badly drawn hills are actually platforms, so you have to work out which is the best route to the top and try and avoid the very poor collision detection. Not knowing where the platforms start and end make it tricky, but I think after a few plays you should be able to make it to the top and on to the next level. And all of this is done in silence. The animation is okay on the main character, but the gameplay is hardly anything new. The second level then, and what the hell, or should I say, what the hell fire. Here you run around, and when you go behind a pillar, you reappear somewhere else. Now this is not random, so you have to work out the correct sequence to get to the top again. You can walk both ways through a pillar as well, and it will take you to different places. The thing at the bottom is a real pain, it's a minotaur apparently, but if you bump into that, you are sent flying across the screen, and die, and then reappear, and can instantly die again. Very bad game design, that. You can use the red trampoline at the bottom left to reach higher platforms too, but you still have to work out in which order to move through the pillars. It seems there is some weird things going on here. To complete this level, you have to walk halfway through and then back again several pillars, otherwise you go to the wrong place. Once you know how to do it, you can complete this fairly easily. On to the third level then. And here, your character is continually moving, and you just have to direct them to the chest, whilst avoiding the two enemies. You have a number of maces that you can throw, but sometimes you just don't need them. This is a tricky section if you get the timing wrong, but once you work out the control, again it's fairly easy. I just ran about and hit the chest, and that was it. The game looped round to the start again. At this point, it just got worse, but I wanted to stop playing anyway. The three levels seem as though they were built using Herg, Melbourne House's terrible games designer. And remember, you've heard no sound at any part in this game. The control is a bit tricky in some places, and screens where you just have to work things out, it's all trial and error, with limited lives. A game to stay clear of then. I think the best thing about it was the registration form, still on the inlay, filled in by the previous owner. And I think that person thought the same about the game as I do. I love things like this in games when I find them. Someone bought this, picked it off the shelf, paid for it, probably looking at his age, from pocket money, got home, loaded it up, and probably thought it wasn't worth all the effort. Welcome back, Alan. Yes, hello, Paul. Nice to, nice to be chatting again. Yeah, um, this is about your new release. For a bit of background, we both love 80s arcade machines. We certainly do. And in do. fact, you, you've done a few conversions yourself. We've got Joust and Terrapins and Lunar Rescue and Asteroids. Uh-huh. Indeed. And 
and we both know the huge amounts of Pac-Man clones on the spectrum. Yes. So why choose Pac-Man as your next conversion? Well, I remember that you did that uh, whole thing where you played all those Pac-Men games or whatever. I don't know what the plural is, but uh, and you very kindly said that mine was your favourite. But that was just a that was just like a mod, really. It was just like a hack. I even called it Pack Hack to point out the fact that it was it wasn't like a, a proper game, if you like. I just mm, modded yeah. the. It's a mod of a of a mod, isn't it? Because it's it's a mod of the Atari game, which in turn was a mod of yeah. another game. So <laughs> it was it was Zedman, yeah, exactly. And then a couple more versions came out that I think were a little bit better. And I thought, well, you know what? I've I've been meaning to what to do a, a really good version if I could. And I reckon I had the skills at this point to to pull it off. So decided to give it a go. What were the challenges? I mean, I've got, I've got my ideas of what the challenges were. But you can obviously put your side across him. You probably have different challenges yeah. to what I'm thinking. Well, what do you think the challenges were? I thought the challenges would be in the Ghost AI because all of the Spectrum versions, or most of them at least, the Ghost just homed in on the player. But um, you know as well as I do that the arcade one, each Ghost had a separate personality, if you like, and they exactly, all did different yeah. things. And I was just wondering, I mean, the challenge of getting that onto a Spectrum, I would have thought would have been a little bit complicated. Well, it's not, not nearly as complicated as you might imagine. The code has been fairly well analyzed at this point after sort of 40, 40 44 years, actually, I think. So oh, right. this is a, one of the most popular games of all time, isn't it? Essentially, the way that it works is that each of the ghosts has two modes, which is a scatter mode where they are given a, a target to aim for, which is the top four corners. So each ghost tries to head for one of those top four corners. And then they switch into another mode where each of them has a different tactic for chasing Pac-Man, which basically means a specific tile that they aim for. So the red one always aims ahead of Pac-Man. The pink one tries to ambush you by sort of aiming behind. The blue one decides where to go based on the red one to try to sort of gang up. And then the, ye the yellow one, which is the sort of shy one, chases you aggressively until it gets close and then changes its mind and runs back. Yeah, they're not all doing the same thing, so it looks like there's some intelligence behind it. Yeah, and more particularly, you get the feeling that they're actually working together as well. Each time that they reach a, co a sort of junction, they have to make a decision about which direction to take. They're not allowed to turn back on themselves, so then they make a decision based on either they're chasing Pac-Man or they're not, as to which one will take them to their, to their destination, if you like. It's like very simple rules suddenly become very complex. I suppose that's many games all throughout history have that, don't they? So, But also, after you play it for a little while, when you know the rules, and there are certain rules, there are certain alleys that, that ghosts are not allowed to go up. There's a few little rules like that. I've tried to implement almost all of them. You also slow down slightly when you eat, each time you eat a pill, and you speed right. up slightly when you eat, each time when you eat a power pill. So, so for you, what were the challenges then? Obviously something different to what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> well, the biggest challenge really was this is a vertical monitor game. Mm, and obviously yep. this is a horizontal, right? So this is the, the same problem I have, I've had with, well, you mentioned Terrapins, for example. That was also a vertical monitor. And Lunar Rescue, right? Yeah. A lot of those early games were vertical monitor games. So fitting everything in was a challenge because you couldn't put the regular maze on there, the full-size maze. So yeah, the challenge was to try to make a maze that looked like the arcade and also had the right number of dots. Right, yeah. So basically what happens is that the, the key to it really is to have a 7x7 seven seven sprite Pac-Man. So you might notice that he is slightly smaller. Okay. And what that does is, if you imagine within a character square, that allows a little tiny movement of one pixel to the left or the right, which mm -hmm. means that you can line him up in the maze. Yeah. So it's a kind of an optical illusion, really. It's a bit of smoke and mirrors, you know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to fully, perfectly recreate the arcade because it wouldn't be possible. So, I, I, but I just wanted to, to make a version of Pac-Man that I'd like to play and that the Spectrum could be proud of. You know, that's really all I wanted to do. I also noticed that you've utilised ULA Plus as well. Yeah, yeah. I usually try to include that. It's nice if you have the option to just um, bring the authentic arcade colors, you know. Yeah, there's one of the ghosts is obviously orange and the a little bit less pink, so yeah, you can you can just enable that. But uh, sounds were pretty good actually, I thought even on the The, so the sounds were excellent, yeah. And the the killer question, there's a hint in that is the, is there going to be a kill screen? Ah, yes. 
Well, I thought about that, and um, I think what I'll do, I haven't decided yet, but I think I'm, I'll probably put a little Easter egg in there, something like that. With that done, have you got any more plans to bring some classic games to the Spectrum? Yeah, surely I have. I mean, I, I, I've got all, all kinds of different plans, to be honest. I, I mean, I, I, I kind of play my cards close to my chest with that, really, as you know. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. I know that you're a, a big fan of Juno First, for example. And I, Oh, yes, yes. I'd love to. That's one I'd love to do. I haven't coded it at all. I messed about with a little bit of a logo, but I'd love to do that mm. at some point. I mean, Donkey Kong, obviously. And, and of course, you're going to be continue, continuing to release on your Midnight Brew label yep. on Real Media. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll we'll have five games. I think uh, most of them are more or less kind of, we're kind of done. We haven't announced them yet. We won't be doing that for a little while. But yeah, we pretty much have a good idea of what they're going to be. And um, we're planning to do some other releases as well. So we've got something to look forward to for Crash Live then this year. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we'll <laughs> definitely have those five and probably at least another couple. And who who knows? Thank you, as always, for bringing an, another excellent release and for letting me um, talk about it for the show. Yeah, always a pleasure, Paul. Always happy. Thanks a lot, everyone. Happy coding. This is Pac-Man Begins, released in 2024 by Hi Rise, a.k.a. Alan Turvey. Take the classic Pac-Man arcade game, strip it down to its simplest form, reduce the control to a single button, but keep the graphics and sound and gameplay. How is that possible? Well, this is how. Batman moves, and you change direction using the single key. You have to collect the dots, avoid the ghosts, collect the bonuses, and eat the power pills. It's the same idea as the arcade machine, but in a much simpler form. The graphics and sound are fantastic, and this game is so addictive. Hats off to Alan for making this. Grab this now, and please give a little money to help fund more games like this. This is just superb. It's rather a quick review, but then again, it's a simple game. I can't really say any more other than go and get it. Eddie Kidd was an English motorbike stunt rider. He was also a stuntman in films such as Goldeneye and The Living Daylights, where riding motorbikes fast and jumping over things were required. He had many career highlights including jumping over the Great Wall of China in 1993. He was also challenged by the son of Evil Knievel, Robbie Knievel, to a jump off. Each rider had three jumps and the one whose cumulative distance was greater would win. Eddie won by five or six feet depending on your source. He retained the winner's belt as no further contests were held. Tragically, he had a life-changing crash in 1996, suffering brain damage and paralysis. He battled on and even took part in the 2011 London Marathon, walking the full distance with a specially designed frame in 43 days. What a hero! In 1984, Martek released Eddie Kid Jump Challenge. You can become Eddie as he attempts different jumps. Inside you get an official Jump Challenge contender card, which is missing from mine, which you can complete, send back and enter a competition with prizes such as BMX bikes, computers and televisions. You also get an official Jump Challenge contender sticker, and this can be stuck on your bike, bag, book or hat, so the inlay states. On to the game then. You start off small, riding a BMX bike and attempting to jump over barrels. You first move the bike to the left, to a distance you think is adequate to make the jump. You then head right, collecting speed, hopefully enough to make the jump. Once you hit the ramp, there's not a lot you can do in the BMX section other than wait. And eventually you'll make the jump. I found it best going full speed in this section because there's nothing else to do. If you make this jump, which is quite easy, you move on to the next part which becomes more challenging. You have to ride a motorbike and you now start to jump cars. 
You also get extra things like gears and wind to contend with. You begin with eight cars and again have to move off to the left before turning round and now it's important to get the speed and gear correct. Once you hit the ramp, you have further controls to move Eddie forwards and backwards on the bike to make sure he gets a good landing. And this is affected by the wind, of course. And that's it, that's the game, you keep on going, jump in more and more cars. I can see what they were trying to do, and I can hear you all saying, yes, we're cashing in on Eddie Kid, and maybe you're right, it is a very simple game. It could have been made a bit more interesting with different motorbikes, and things like buses to jump over later on. As it is, it's not a game I'd come back to, and it's such a pity that a legend such as Eddie has this sort of game with his name on it. A nice little new feature there about famous people who put their names to games and it was really interesting to see Eddie Kidd as the first one because he had a really interesting story and I didn't really know his full story until I started doing that section. We're just going to chat about people who've put names to games. So Eddie Kidd, the game really didn't live up to the hype, I don't think. No, it didn't. It, was, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't the greatest game ever, was it? Uh, no, it was it, so much more could have been done to it. And part of this little chat is I wonder how many people that put their names to games actually were involved with the games. I mean, I don't know how much involvement Eddie Kidd had, probably very little, to be honest. That reminds me, didn't they get some karate expert to help them with where the exploding fist? I'm sure I read that in a magazine all the way back in the day. Uh, I don't I know there was a judo expert who helped with brian of, jacks yeah, no it was um yeah, what was it called it might have been brian jacks actually it was a game called yeah. U uchi mata or something i can't remember what the f name was but it, it, it didn't actually, have his I name think, on it. i think i think there was a brian jacks game yes there was a brian jacks super challenge i think a bit like that tv program with kevin keegan where he fell off his bike <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure he wasn't the only person to fall off his bike was that called superstars or that's super it yeah superstars or super something superstars, like that yeah. yeah okay so the benefits have got to be both ways haven't they? there had to be benefits for the company they would obviously get a name on the game which would sell it even though it might not have been made for that i had this thing in my mind that a company produced a game and then thought who can we do this with who can we put a name against and that's that's particularly relevant for football games of which there are a, a lot and i think they just might have made a football game and thought who whose name can we put against this yeah, I think everyone had a football game, didn't they? Or anyone remotely famous seemed to. Peter Shilton. Was it Handball Maradona? Some, yeah. Sure. Um, Emlyn Hughes had a game. Gaza. Gaza. Uh, Kenny Dalgleish. Uh, Gary Lineker. <laughs> yeah, so, so many footballers put their name to games. So the most famous must have been Daley Thompson. Yeah, yeah, for the, for the Olympics, yeah. Yeah. Do you think Ocean made their track and field type game and then try to get someone to sponsor it like daily thompson oh no because it was it was a decathlon game wasn't it it's the 10 it was a decathlon game yeah i mean th there was a lot of track and field games coming out at that time i yeah. think there's about four or five of them probably more and there were also a lot of olympic games going back to the football thing do you think they were playing to the demographic at the time you're talking you know teenage boys yeah possibly although i i didn't like football much when i was a kid and i think a lot of people who stayed in and played games might not have but i guess there was some crossover and another probably secondly second to daily thompson probably frank bruno yeah yeah definitely he was particularly famous wasn't he and and that was another good game as well 
and and it was released alongside a lot of other boxing games to match um, Punch Out in the arcade. Yeah, and, but I think I mean, and Rocky that, the sprite, then the got like, renamed to Rocco, didn't to, it? To Rocco, yes. Yeah, yeah that's I right. mean it's basically a Punch Out rip off. In the, yeah. in the same way that Dilly Thompson's a track and field ripper. I think even some of the opponents are very are named of or look like the arcade equivalents. Yeah, the first one that you fight, the Canadian Crusher, looks exactly like the first fighter out of Punch House. And, and here's another one I'm going to throw past you, just just as a bit of a curveball. Bruce Lee, how about that? Well, yeah, but he didn't give his name, did he? Because he wasn't alive anymore when the game came out. <laughs> Obviously, I f- presumably it's not. On whoever owned the rights for the films, I would have thought. Yeah, great, great use of a posthumous celebrity endorsement, though. <laughs> there was, there was, of course, Barry McGuigan's boxing as well. We talked about boxing games, Barry McGuigan. Yeah, yeah. Which, which was, which was interesting actually. It wasn't the kind of what third person over the shoulder perspective game it was a it was a side on one you had training aspects where you had to decide how you would train and then how you train determined your certain levels of things like endurance when you went into the ring so were there any other there were some other sports weren't there there were there were a few other sports john barrington squash yep I don't know. I never played, but it must have been incredibly difficult to get squash on this spectrum. And how about Nick Faldo's golf? Yeah, golf games didn't get good until like future consoles, or did they? Until they got like no, 3D no. and things like that. But in in general, and to wind up, I think that the vast majority of games that had people's names against them were poor. I mean, Daley Thompson was good. Frank Bruno was good. Yeah. Beyond that, I'm struggling to think of. Um, oh, I think Emlyn Hughes is re- highly regarded. Yeah. But apart from that, you know, I'm struggling to think of anything that where people go, oh, that was a fantastic game. And Yeah, a few of them weren't bad. I didn't think any kids was too bad, although it, I'll admit it's about 40 years since I've played it. So, so I'm, I'm assuming then, Jeff, you're looking forward to all the next episodes where we've got lots of famous names in games. I am. I can't wait to see which famous name games you're going to pick, Paul, and, and hopefully you'll pick some of the better ones. Thank you.